Hello everyone. Welcome to part two of our three-part PowerPoint series. Part one has already been posted. The title is Ellen White, Daniel and the Revelation, and Turkey. As you can see, the title for this in part two is Miller's Rules of Interpretation, Daniel 8, the correct understanding of the four horns and turkey. We'll have quite a bit to cover today. Although we didn't really touch on turkey in part one, we will uh, just be scratching the surface in this part. This is truly something you do not want to miss. Be sure to pass this to all your friends and family. In this video, we're going to see that Christ's second coming is truly imminent and that God has given us a precise event to let us know that our high priest is truly about to wrap up his work in the most holy place. So this is truly um, a presentation you do not want to miss. Okay, we're going to go on into our presentation for today. In first manuscript release, page 38, paragraph 1, we are told the following. Nine-tenths of our people, including many of our teachers and ministers, are content with surface truths. First manuscript release, 38, paragraph 1. Nine-tenths is 90 percent. And I believe this number is even higher. I think it's about 99.9 .9 percent today. And why do I say that? Because when this was written in 1901, we didn't have the movie theaters and the casinos and the internet and all of the things, television, that we have to distract today. They didn't have these distractions back in those days. Yet only 90% of people in those days were really digging deep. Okay, and we're not to be content with surface truths. And if you notice, if many of our teachers and ministers are included in this number. We are to study for ourselves. Young men should search the scriptures for themselves. They are not to feel that it is sufficient for those older and experienced to find out the truth, that the younger ones can accept it from them as authority. The Jews perished as a nation because they were drawn from the truth of the Bible by their rulers, priests, and elders. Had they heeded the lessons of Jesus and searched the scriptures for themselves, they would not have perished. Testimonies to Ministers, page 109, paragraph 2. When it comes to this subject, we want to study for ourselves, and we don't have to sit up under ministers and take everything they say for granted, not saying we shouldn't listen to them, but we want to make sure we go check everything out for ourselves. We are to study for ourselves. If you go to 2 Timothy, let's go to 2 Timothy, and always be sure to have your Bibles. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15, chapter 2, verse 15, and I'll give everyone a few seconds to get to that. Make sure you always have your Bibles uh, during these presentations. 2 Timothy chapter 2.15 tells us, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And in Acts chapter 17 verse 11, Acts 17 verse 11, we are counseled the following, Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 tells us these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So the Bereans were very noble in the fact that they went and searched the scriptures daily. When Paul was speaking to them, they went and compared what he said to the scrolls that existed in their day. So brothers and sisters, anything we hear, anytime you hear a message on YouTube, anytime you 
hear a message at church. We are counseled to have a uh, notepad and a pay, uh, pen or pencil. Write everything down, all the references, go look them up, and make sure that they are truthful. Okay? We must study the truth for ourselves. No man should be relied upon to think for us. No matter who he is or in what position he may be placed, we are not to look upon any man as a criterion for us. We are to counsel together and to be subject one to another. But at the same time, we are to exercise the ability God has given us in order to learn what is truth. Each one of us must look to God for divine enlightenment. We must individually develop a character that will stand the test in the day of God. We must not become set in our ideas and think that no one should interfere with our opinions. Testimonies to Ministers, page 109, paragraph 4. Why do we need to study for ourselves? Many will stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. Testimonies to Ministers, page 409, paragraph 3. Brothers and sisters, it is not safe to trust anything you hear from our pulpits today without going and studying for yourselves. And why is that? Because many, and that word many means a grand part, many are going to stand in our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. So it's important that we study for ourselves. Do not trust to the wisdom of any man or to the investigations of any man. Go to the scriptures for yourselves. Search the inspired word with humble hearts. Lay aside your preconceived opinions. 1888, 547, paragraph 5. No matter what we've been led to believe regarding any of our prophecies, we need to always study for ourselves and we need to lay aside preconceived opinions. According to the prophet, how are we to study? The record of the experience through which the people of God passed in the early history of our work must be republished. Many of those who have since come into the truth are ignorant of the way in which the Lord wrought. The experience of William Miller should be kept before our people. Councils to Writers and Editors, page 145, paragraph 2. What was one of the experiences of Miller? According to the prophet, she says, those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message, and that's supposed to be every one of us, according to Testimonies, volume 9, page 19, paragraph 1. So those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. In the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study and interpretation. And so before we go on, you can find this on the CD-ROM in the Pioneer section under William Miller's name. And the book is called Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology. Or you can type in a couple words from some of his rules and it will take you right there in the Pioneer section. So let's continue on what she says. So Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent important rules for Bible study and interpretation. Every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. All scripture is necessary and may be understood by diligent application and study. Number three, nothing revealed in scripture can or will be hid from those who ask in faith not wavering. To understand doctrine, bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know, then let every word have its proper influence. And if you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be in error. Number five, scripture must be its own expositor, since it is a rule of itself. If I depend on a teacher to expound to me, and he should guess at its meaning or desire to have it so on account of his
his sectarian creed or to be thought wise then his guessing desire creed or wisdom is my rule and not the bible review and herald november 25th 1884 paragraph 24 Continuing on, the above is a portion of these rules, and in our study of the Bible, we shall all do well to heed the principles set forth. So she gives five rules, but she says it's a portion of his rules, and in our study of the Bible, we shall all do well to heed the principles set forth. Review and Herald, November 25th, 1884, paragraph 25. Many people have never heard of Miller's rules, but they are called the 14 rules of biblical interpretation or Miller's rules of interpretation. See Miller, William Miller's 14 rules of interpretation, and you can look it up on the CD-ROM in the Pioneer section. Here's a link for the book Sister White mentioned. If you go to pages 20 to 24, you will find Miller's Rules there. And remember, we are all supposed to be teaching the third angel's message, so every one of us is supposed to be studying upon Miller's Rules, upon his plan of interpretation. Here's a link with the rules as well. Okay, so please go to the page with Miller's Rules. In your own time, please go and study and learn those rules, for this is essential to know how to properly study the scriptures and prophecies. In Second Manuscript Release, page 96, paragraph 2, we are counseled, He who presents the truth of the prophecies in the right way will use scripture to explain scripture he will make the Bible its own expositor so if we're going to present the truths of the prophecies correctly we don't need commentaries or Hebrew and Greek we are only going to use the Bible and let the Bible explain itself that word expositor means vocabulary um, dictionary and interpreter now let's go to Daniel chapter 8. We're going to Daniel chapter 8. And I'll give everyone a few seconds to get there. Go to Daniel chapter 8. 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. And now let's look at verses 1 through 3 and verse 20. Daniel 8 verses 1 through 3 and verse 20. So verse 1 tells us in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. Verse 2, and I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Verse 3. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Now before we get to verse 20, um, a verse that I don't have listed on here, but you want to mark down. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, to see that a beast represents a kingdom. Daniel 7, 23. Let's see what a beast represents. Verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. And I'm just going to stop right there. So a beast represents a kingdom. Now let's go to Daniel 8.20 to see what the ram represents. Because this is definitely a beast. So verse 20 tells us, The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, 
are the kings of Media and Persia. The kings of Media and Persia. So, this ram we're reading in verses 1 through 3 is none other than Medo-Persia. Now, let's look at verse 4. What direction does this ram come from? I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beasts or no other kingdoms might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So this kingdom is pushing westward and southward, or excuse me, northward and southward. So where is this kingdom coming from? It's coming from the east. Let's continue on. And what I'd like you to do is get yourself a piece of paper. And on the top, I want you to put north. And get, get a nice size standard notebook size piece of paper or computer copy paper. And at the top, I want you to write north. At the bottom, I want you to write south. On the left side of the paper, I want you to put west. And on the right side of the paper, I would like you to put east. These are the four compass, uh, four points of the compass uh, or of the globe of the earth. So north at the top, south at the bottom, west to the left, and east to the right. Okay, so the ram, which is Medo-Persia, or just Persia today, is in the east. Okay, so on the right side of your paper, underneath where it says east, in parentheses, I want you to put Persia. And underneath that, put modern Iran. Modern Iran. So Persia, modern Iran. Okay, so let's continue. Now let's look at verse 5 and verse 21. So it says, And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So here we have another beast coming on the scene, and we know a beast is a kingdom, and this beast is described as a goat. And where does this goat come from? The west. So on your paper, I want you to put west on the left side. And in parentheses under that, in just a moment, let's go to verse 21 of chapter 5. Let's see who this goat is. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So this is Greece. And Greece actually comes from Macedonia. And this is in the west. So I want you to put Macedonia forward slash Greece. Put that in parentheses. And Alexander the Great was the first great king. Alexander the Great was the first great king. Okay, now let's continue on. Now let's read verses 6 through 7. And he, talking about Alexander the Great, came to the ram, which is Persia, that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram and break his two horns and there was no power in the ram to stand before him but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand so here you have a battle between greece and persia okay and alexander won and conquered the entire world faster than any human being he was 25 years old Okay, so this ram is conquered, which is none other than Medo-Persia. If you study the characteristics of Medo-Persia um, in other chapters, it's represented as a bear, and the bear is lifted up on its side, meaning 
Medo-Persia, one of these kingdoms would rise higher than the other. And that was Persia who did that. So now here we have Persia fighting with Greece and Alexander becomes the conqueror. He comes out as the conqueror. Let's continue on. Now let's look at verse 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So, in the prime of his life, and the pinnacle of his kingdom, Alexander died at the young age of 33 years old from a drunken debauchery. What happened to his kingdom? It was divided into four among his four generals. And we'll be learning more about that. So now Greece, which rules the world at this time, and the farthest west at this time is Macedonia and Greece. Okay? And the farthest east at this time is Persia, Alrighty, at this particular time, let's continue on. Now, what determines what is north, south, east, and west? So, how can we say Persia's in the east and and uh, Macedonia and Greece are in the west? What determines that? Well, let's go to First Kings, chapter four, verses thirty and thirty-four. First Kings, chapter four, verses thirty and thirty-four. I promise you, you do not want to miss this study. Brothers and sisters, this is such a fascinating study. And when I learned this, I was so excited. And I praise the Lord for this information. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 30 and 34 tells us the following. Okay. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of the east so solomon's wisdom excelled the children of the east now what determines what is east let's look at verse 34 and there came of all the people to hear the wisdom of solomon from all kings of the earth which he had heard of his wisdom now where was solomon located in jerusalem which is what is in uh, which is in what is called Palestine so Palestine was the central determining point whatever was west of Palestine was considered the west whatever was north was considered the northeast was considered the east and whatever was south was considered the south now before it was called Jerusalem it was called the land of Canaan and when Abraham lived over there, remember it, the Bible said he would go south and he would go to Egypt. Now I just gave it away, but Egypt is the south and we'll be learning that in the future. But put down on your paper down in the south, put Egypt and adjacent countries. Egypt is at the top of Africa and all the adjacent countries that existed at this time of Greece splitting up was considered the south. Let's continue on. So the goat, which is Greece, split into four literal geographical divisions. So remember, Greece comes out of Macedonia, and Alexander was actually the king of Macedonia. So it splits into four literal geographical divisions, north, south, east, and west. And we're going to find out what these divisions were. The west was Macedonia and Greece. The north is what was called Thrace, Asia Minor, Bosphorus, and the Hellespont. The east was Persia, Babylon, and Syria. Syria is in the northeast. It's part of the north, but it's also mainly in the east. And the south is Egypt and the adjacent countries. See the following links. Okay, so we have a link about Thrace and a link about Asia Minor. And if you go to both of these links, 
you will see that Thrace is the area that modern today, in modern day today, is called Eastern Europe. Okay? And Asia Minor today is what is called Western Asia. Eastern Europe is what was Thrace. That was the area of Thrace. And then the area known as Asia Minor is today what we call Western Asia, the western part of Asia. Thrace and Asia Minor explanations. Thrace is what is known as the eastern part of Europe where Turkey dwells today. Turkey dwells in this area. Asia Minor is the western part of Asia where Turkey also dwells. Turkey dwells in what is known as Eurasia, part Europe, part Asia, the eastern part of Europe, the western part of Asia. And as we saw above, both of these parts of Eurasia were once called Thrace and Asia Minor, and that's in the north. So in the north, you want to put in parentheses Thrace slash Asia Minor. This is on your paper so that you can have a visual for yourself. Thrace slash Asia Minor uh, slash Bosphorus, B-O-S-P-H-O-R-U-S, -S or it could be spelled B-O-S-P-O-R-U-S. And then underneath that, put modern day Turkey, modern day Turkey. Okay, that's the north. Now, let's read this from Uriah Smith's book that we learned about in part one that is to be read as long as probationary time lasts, that every one of us are supposed to read this book and that this was God's helping hand. Okay, and that the truths are made out so plainly in this book that none need err therein. The king of the north and the king of the south are many times referred to in the remaining portion of this chapter. Now he's in verses 5 and 6 when you get to this page. It therefore becomes essential to an understanding of the prophecy clearly to identify these powers. When Alexander's empire was divided, the different portions lay toward the four winds of heaven west, north, east, and south. These divisions, of course, to be reckoned from the standpoint of Palestine, the native land of the prophet. That division of the empire line west of Palestine would thus constitute the kingdom of the west. That line north, the kingdom of the north. That line east, the kingdom of the east. And that line south, the kingdom of the south. The divisions of Alexander's kingdom with respect to Palestine were situated as follows. Cassander had Greece and the adjacent countries which lay to the west. So put that on your paper underneath all the information you put on the left side of your paper. Put in parentheses Cassander. Okay? Lysimachus had Thrace which then included Asia Minor and the country's line on the Hellespont and Bosphorus, which lay to the north of Palestine. So at the top of your paper, underneath everything you've written, in parentheses, at the bottom of everything else, put Lysimachus. Okay, Seleucus so had Syria and Babylon, which lay principally to the east. So to the right, where it says Persia, Syria, Babylon, Un, in parentheses underneath everything on the right side put Seleucus and Ptolemy had Egypt and the neighboring countries which lay to the south now let's continue on here's a second witness from James White in 1865 the Grecian Empire maintained its unity only during the life of Alexander when his brilliant career ended in a drunken debauch, the empire was shortly divided between his four leading generals, represented by the four heads of the leopard. Cassander had Macedon and Greece in the west. 
Lysimachus had Thrace and the parts of Asia on the Hellespont and Bosphorus in the north. Ptolemy received Egypt, Lydia, Arabia, Palestine, and Coel, Syria in the south, and Seleucus had Syria and all the rest of Alexander's dominion in the east. Now, we're not going to get into this in detail, but here's what happened. Lysimachus, who was in the north, conquered Cassander, who was in the west, and he got all of the western territory, which he attached to his northern territory. Seleucus, in the east, conquered Lysimachus, who had the north and the west. And now, Seleucus, he has the east, the north, and the west. Okay, and Ptolemy had the south, which was Egypt and the adjacent countries of Egypt. Okay, so let's look at the 1843 chart. Okay, this chart is a part of our Adventist history. And Joseph Bates talks much about this chart, as does Loughborough in his book, Great Second Advent Movement, page 124. Uh, Sister White talks about this chart also in Great Controversy, page 392 and um, if you see the goat head on the chart you notice the goat head to the left you have the Daniel 2 image and then to the right is Daniel chapter 7 you have the lion with the two wings the bear with the three ribs in its mouth and the leopard with the four wings that's Daniel 7 and then you see the goat head underneath with the four horns okay so this chart let's see what we're counseled in early writings page 74 paragraph 1 you can hear what the prophet says regarding this chart in early writings 74 paragraph 1 we're told I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered that the figures were as he wanted them that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed okay so this was directed by the hand of the Lord and in another quote in um, if you go to the pioneer section on the CD-ROM in quotation marks type in well you want to click the large binoculars on the top left side when you get there a query box will pop up inside that box put quotation marks and then put um, oh I'm trying to think here hold on just a moment Charles Fitch in quotation marks and continue till you get to Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. It might be page 221 or 222. But it talks about it was the Holy Spirit that led Charles Fitch into making this chart. Okay? So she says it was the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. That the figures were as he wanted them. So here we have an endorsement of this chart. This is a part of Adventist history, and if you go to the Pioneer section of the CD-ROM, click the large binoculars again, and when the box pops up, put quotation marks and the word yellowed and quotation marks again, and hit enter. There will be two hits. The second hit uh, is a quote about Loughborough in 1913 where when he was at a general conference session that Sister White was in attendance of when he was going over the history of the first and second angels messages as an introduction to his talk he pulled out this old 1843 chart and he was teaching the history from that chart and all this chart is is just the messages that Miller and his associates were teaching and if you read early writings page 229 paragraph 1 we are counseled 
that Miller was the man especially chosen. He was raised by God and given the commencement of the chain of truth. That means the beginning of the prophetic messages. So this chart is a part of our history and we're counseled. One of the ways Satan deceives us is by robbing the people of God of their past history. So on that chart, we see the goat head. Let's continue on. Let's look at an up close look at this goat head. Okay, so here's the goat head from the chart. You see Rome in the, or, I'm sorry, excuse me. Let's ignore Rome. You see Macedonia in the west. You see Thrace in the north, Syria in the east, and Egypt in the south. This is what our pioneers taught, and this is what they believed. Now, if you go to the goat head with the four horns, representing Greece and its four divisions, has been removed from most 1843 charts. However, an original chart is in the Andrews University vault. And you can see this chart at Andrews on the YouTube video below, and he'll show you the goat head. So if you just go to youtube.com and type in 1843 chart at Andrews, the video will pop up, or you can copy and paste this link, type the link in on YouTube, and then um, you'll find it there as well. So the original chart that's in the vault at Andrews has the goat head. But many of the charts in churches today, the goat head is missing, but you will see a blank space with writing around it telling you about Alexander's kingdom be being divided in four, but the picture has been removed. And I find it to be very interesting, and we'll get more into that, why it had been removed, why I believe it's been removed. So let's continue on. So go to one minute on the timeline, and then you will uh, get to, because he gives preliminaries, so just go straight to one minute on the timeline, and you'll, he'll get right to the goat. Okay. So let's go to Daniel 8, chapter 9. So now let's go to Daniel 8, 9. Let's look at Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9. And I'll give everyone a few seconds to get there. So in verse 9 it says, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east, and toward the pleasant land toward the south toward the east and toward the pleasant land now where is this little horn which we later read we know is the papacy okay so now after Greece here you have um, excuse me not the papacy pagan Rome pagan Rome comes before papal Rome so now you have pagan Rome on the scene so if you look at Daniel 2, you have the four metals, the gold, the silver, um, the gold representing Babylon, the silver representing Medo-Persia, the br uh, brass representing Greece, okay, and then you have the iron legs representing pagan Rome. And then the feet, that's part iron, part clay, clay representing church, and iron representing state because it's a kingdom. God says he's the potter where the clay, church and state united. That's the papacy there. Okay? So the belly and thighs of brass, that represents Greece. Okay? Then you have Rome. Well, Daniel 8, 9, now you have pagan Rome coming on the scene. Now, which one of these four parts does Rome come out of? Because remember, Greece, Alexander's kingdom was divided into four. So which of these four divisions? Was it the north? Was it the south? Was it the east? Or was it the west? And by the way, for those who may not know, the acronym NEWS, the word NEWS, comes from northeast, west, and south. Okay. 
So let's look here. So let's look, look, look at the slide and hand out with the goat head again. So there's the goat head. Now, where do you see Rome coming out of? Do you see it coming out of Thrace, which is in the north? Do you see it coming out of Egypt, which is, which is in the south? Do you see it coming out of Syria, which is in the east? Or do you see it coming out of the Macedonian horn? It's coming out of the Horn of Macedonia. Therefore, Rome is located in the West. And it is called one of the kingdoms of the West, modern day. The United States and Rome, or Europe, is called the West. Now, at this time, Rome, the, Europe doesn't exist. It's just Greece, Macedonia, and Rome in the West. Rome doesn't exist, or excuse me, Europe doesn't start to exist, the division of the kingdoms, until sometime in the 300 A.D.s. 300s A.D. Okay, let's keep going. Now let's look at a quote on the next slide. The interest that Brother Simpson has aroused is a remarkable one. Brother Simpson presents the truth just as it was presented in past years. He has a system of charts that is the most perfect thing of its kind that I have ever seen. I know that he is sound on every point of our faith and that the power of God is with him. So, here comes this brother named Brother Simpson in the 1900s. He has a system of charts. They're a type of flip charts. And they're the best or most perfect thing of their kind that the prophet has ever seen. She's not saying it's better than the 1843 and 1850 charts. And for those who want to know about the 1863 chart, which was uh, endorsed by the prophet, I have a, a title called, What About the 1863 Chart? I'm going to be doing a video on that as well. That's a powerful video. Um, I think you guys will learn a lot when you see that particular video. So, according to what we're reading here, this brother was sound on every point of our faith. Well, let's see what he put on his chart. So, if he's sound on every point of our faith, he's teaching truth and not error. So, Brother Simpson's chart, if you go to the correct Daniel and the Revelation, if you go to page 137, it's a purple book with two candles on the front, and it's from his publishing vine. Okay, you will see the chart, or the picture of this chart of Simpsons, but here it is below. You can go to that link right there, copy and paste it, or type it in on YouTube, and you will find, I'm, I'm sorry, not on YouTube but type it in on a Google search, just like it says, and you will find this actual picture. Okay, here's Brother Simpson's chart. So, if you look, there's Grecia, the goat, and now here's the goat being divided into four. You have Egypt, now these aren't in the right order, but you have Egypt, Syria, Egypt's in the south, Syria's in the east, Macedonia is in the west and Thrace is in the north. Now, where is Rome coming out of? Macedonia. So Rome, brothers and sisters, is geographically located in the west. These are literal geographical locations. Rome comes from the west. Let's continue on. And Rome is conquered Macedonia. Rome actually came out of Macedonia. Okay, let's go to Miller's Rules again. Um, you should have a handout. If you went to the links I told you, you want to print the handout out so you can have all of Miller's Rules. If you would like Miller's Rules email to me, go to the end of this video and you will see an email address where you can request Miller's Rules. What I tell everyone to do is have them printed and then laminate them at your local um, stationery store 
such as Staples or Office Max. Okay, so now we're going to look at rule number 11 because remember, we've been counseled that all of us, when we're teaching the Third Angel's message, we are to go along Miller's plan, his rules of interpretation. So let's look at rule number 11. How to know when a word is used figuratively. If it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. So let me explain this. It is always going to be literal unless it does violation to the laws of nature. Let me give you an example. We see Adam and Eve ate a fruit. We see a snake. We know that's not symbolical. It's not metaphorical. It's literal. Okay? Now, in Daniel, we see beasts and horns. Okay? And in Revelation chapter 12, we see a woman standing on the moon clothed in the sun. We know that this is a violation to the laws of nature. No human being can be wrapped in the sun. If the sun was to move one hair breadth closer to earth than it is already, earth would burn up. So for a person to wrap themselves in the sun, we know this is not, this is symbolical. So therefore this would be uh, figurative and then we need to look for the symbol what this represents but if it talks about towers falling can towers literally fall absolutely so it wouldn't be figurative it would be literal if we see Jesus feeding the fish uh, excuse me feeding the people fish we know this is literal but if you see a beast coming up out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns as you find in Revelation 13 verse 1 we know this is a violation to the laws of nature there's no such beast that exists in the water and I say praise God for that so it is always to be considered literally unless it's going to do violation to the laws of nature now let's see what Joseph Bates the father of Adventism had to say about this. He was one of Miller's associates. Mr. Miller is a great stickler for literal interpretation, never admitting the figurative unless absolutely required to make correct sense or meet the event which is intended to be pointed out. And that's in Joseph Bates' book called Autobiography of Joseph Bates page 248 paragraph 1 with intense interest William Miller studied the books of Daniel and the Revelation employing the same principles of interpretation as in the other scriptures he saw that the prophecies so far as they had been fulfilled had been fulfilled literally that all the various figures metaphors parables similitudes etc were either explained in their immediate connection or the terms in which they were expressed were defined in other scriptures and when thus explained were to be literally understood so Miller knew that these prophecies were to be literally understood and once the figure if there was a figure applied once that figure was understood what it was it was to be understood literally you don't go from figure to literal and then from literal to figure it stops right at the literal and the understanding is to be literally understood and notice this is written in great controversy which is the most important book uh, besides the Bible to go to the world concerning the popular system of interpreting or misinterpreting the scriptures wolf wrote the greater part of the Christian church have swerved from the plain sense of scripture and have turned to the phantomizing system of the Buddhists who suppose that when they are reading Jews
they must understand Gentiles. And when they read Jerusalem, they must understand the church. And if it said earth, it means sky. Great Controversy, page 360, paragraph 1. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to include in here where they're saying the north is the south and the south is the north and the east is the west or the east is the north or the west is the north or the west is the south. When you're flipping what is literal, okay, you're actually doing what the Buddhists are doing. When you're teaching the exact opposite, you're doing what the Buddhists are doing. So if something is in the north, literally, geographically, and you're saying it's in the south, you're actually doing what the Buddhists do. And we're not called to be Buddhist brothers and sisters. We're called to be Seventh-day Adventists. What else does the prophet have to say about this? The truths most plainly revealed in the Bible have been involved in doubt and darkness by learned men who teach that the scriptures have a mystical, a secret, spiritual meaning not apparent in the language employed. These men are false teachers. It was to such a class that Jesus declared, Ye know not the scriptures. Mark 14, 24. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning, unless a symbol or figure is employed. If men would but take the Bible as it reads, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. Brothers and sisters, many of our leaders are spiritualizing the majority of the Bible. When we just learn that we're to take the Bible as it reads, okay, unless... Um, there's a symbol or figure employed and remember according to Miller's rules it's only uh, to be employed to be understood that way if it does harm to the laws of nature okay and what they're doing is they're spiritualizing oh that's not really what it means it means this no brothers and sisters we need to take the Bible as it reads and she says it should be explained according to its obvious meaning. And a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now entering, or excuse me, wandering in error. Great Controversy, page 598, paragraph 3. Go look that up because there's some things I left out just to get to the point of what I was trying to share here but there's other things she says in that particular paragraph that are very powerful if men would read the Bible just as it reads if there was no one teaching that it's spiritual okay a great work would be done and thousands would come into the fold the whole Bible should be given to the people just as it reads it would be better for them not to have Bible instruction at all than to have the teachings of the scriptures thus grossly misinterpreted. Great Controversy, page 521, paragraph 2. Unless there's a figure or a parable that does harm to the laws of nature, if the figure does harm to the laws of nature, unless there's that, we need to take it literally. It is to be understood literally. And brothers and sisters, Rome is literally in the West, geographically literally in the West. Okay, we're going to continue. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in A.D. 1840, sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before Dekozis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, 
and that the 391 years and 15 days commenced at the close of the first period. It will end on the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. Josiah Litch in the Signs of the Times, an expositor of prophecy. Now, I'm not going to go into the seven trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9, but the first four trumpets are found in Revelation 8, and it had to do with the scourge against pagan Rome. And the last three trumpets are found in Revelation 9, and they are called woes, and they have to do with the scourge against papal Rome by Islam. Okay? Now, Josiah Litch wrote a very detailed paper on this, but if you go to Revelation 9, the 150-day prophecy is actually 150 years, and it doesn't take place till they have a leader over them whose name was Othman. Othman, now in Revelation 9, verse 1, Islam is on the scene, Muhammad, okay? And that was in 606 A.D., and you'll find that on the 1843 chart as well. But after Muhammad died and Abu Bakr, his father-in-law, died in the same year, they really have no leader for Islam. And Islam got broken up to many sects, many different fractions. And now in 1299, you have a man named Othman or Otman or Osman, okay? And that's where the name Ottoman Empire comes from. He's now on the scene in 1299, July 27th. He is now the leader of all of Islam, which is mostly in the East. All right? What we call the Middle East today. But it was him who came out of Turkey that was the leader. So the 150-day prophecy is 150 years. It started July 27th, 1299, taking us to July 27th, 1449. And then the... 391 year and 15 day prophecy that continues on in Revelation 9 if you add 391 years to July 27 1449 it takes us to July 27 1840 and if you add 15 days to July 27 it takes us to August 11 1840 so Josiah Litch was predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire, whom Turkey was in charge of. Okay? And now let's look at what we're counseled regarding this in the next quote. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. Now, from 1299 all the way to August 11, 1840, the Ottoman Empire ruled much of what we call Europe today. And she extended herself in much of the west, the north, and the east. Okay? Uh, the west going as far as into Europe. And before European rulers could just do what they wanted, um, especially in the Ottoman Empire territories, they had to get permission from the Turks. Turkey was controlling the goings and comings uh, of Europe, much of Europe. And so now Josiah Litch is telling the world that Turkey is going to fall and surrender to the Christian nation which was Russia, Austria, Prussia, and England, or Britain. And so everyone was in shock, especially Europe, and was like, what are you saying? So the event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller. Now let me tell you why this is so important. In Miller's day, they were saying that a day represented a year in Bible prophecy. And because they were teaching the 2300 days of Daniel 8, 
and Daniel 9. And the Bible critics and the so-called Bible scholars who were into higher criticism, they were saying, no, the Hebrew and the Greek, it tells us that a day says mornings and evenings. So this is a literal day. This is not uh, a year. And Miller was upset. He said, I'd rather have one English in my Bible in my hand than all the Hebrew or Greek or Latin that these men could ever teach. And so Josiah Litch says, we'll prove to you a day represents a year. And that's when he goes through 150 days and Revelation 9 is actually 150 years. And then the next prophecy showing 391 years and 15 days. And so when it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. I'm here to make a declaration. I'm here to say Christ declares the end from the beginning. God declares the end from the beginning as we are told in the book of Isaiah. And let me see if I can find that verse. Give me just a moment so you guys can know where to look for this. Isaiah 55, I believe it is. Let me see. Um, nope, it's not 55. It's in the book of Isaiah. Talking about the Lord declareth the end from the beginning. And I'm not finding it at this particular moment. I apologize. But it's in there. Maybe it's in 44. Just look through your Bible. And it talks about the Lord declareth the end from the beginning. Okay. So, Christ declares the end from the beginning. So, the way the Advent movement started with power is the way it's going to end with power and you'll see this at the end of this presentation a little bit but when we get into part three which you do not want to miss we'll be looking more into detail on how that's happening today but it was understanding Miller's rules of interpretation that gave them the correct understanding regarding Turkey and the Ottoman Empire found in Revelation 9. And that gave the impetus to the message spreading forward. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to make a declaration. When we truly have a correct understanding of Miller's rules of interpretation, then our eyes will be opened up to see this message regarding Turkey for these last days that we've been given, and you will see much continuing on in this presentation and in part three and you will see by an understanding of this the message is going to end with power many people are going to learn the truth about the enforcement of Sunday and the Sunday law many people are going to come into the truth into a knowledge of the truth okay so when it became known multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and in publishing his views and from 1840 to 1844 the work rapidly extended. Great Controversy page 335 paragraph 1. How many knew this history and it's in our book that we're to give to the world. It's next to the Bible. This is the most important book to go to the world. And here is this history regarding Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. How many knew that? Well, we'll be learning more about Turkey when it gave up its power, was starting to regain its power back in the 1850s and especially the 70s, 1880s, 1890s, all the way through the early 1900s. And we'll be learning more of that in detail in part three. Now let's see Miller's 13th rule. Rule number 13, to know whether we have the true historical event of the fulfillment of a prophecy. If you find every word of the prophecy after the figures are understood, it is literally fulfilled then you may know that your history is the true event. 
but if one word lacks a fulfillment then you must look for another event or wait its future development for god takes care that history and prophecy doth agree so that the true believing children of god may never be ashamed so according to miller's thirteenth rule number one every word of the event of a prophecy must be fulfilled literally okay and it can't lack one fulfillment number two history and prophecy doth agree that's very important to remember that rule because we're going to be studying some powerful history okay let's go to Daniel chapter 7 verses 15 and 16 and I know this video is a little lengthy today so you can pause it along the way um, but you do not want to miss the information in this video Daniel chapter 7 verses 15 and 16 I'll give everyone a few seconds to get there. Daniel chapter second, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter seven, verses fifteen through sixteen. Okay, it says, "I Daniel was grieved in my spirit." This is verse fifteen, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by, and asked him the truth of all this so he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things so Daniel's given these visions and there's being beasts and horns and different things being used and the visions trouble him because he doesn't understand and so he asked Gabriel what is the truth he asked him for the truth like what is the true meaning behind all this so he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things so the truth is the interpretation or the interpretation is the truth so let's go to Daniel chapter 11 and let's look at verses 1 and 2 brothers and sisters because before we can get to 11 we need to read 7 and so we need to understand that according to the Bible when Daniel couldn't understand the visions and he asked for the truth Gabriel gave him the literal interpretation okay so let's look at Daniel 11 verse 1 and 2 it says also I in the first year of Darius the Mede even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him so this is Gabriel speaking and this is when Daniel still didn't have a full understanding of some of these visions and now Gabriel comes back um, to give him the understanding verse 2 says and now will I show thee the truth so what did we learn the truth is the literal interpretation so he goes on to say behold there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia he doesn't say three horns coming out of the north or three horns in the east he says three kings he's using literal language here okay and the fourth shall be far richer than they all and by his strength through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia and if you continue on down to verse 6 he's talking about the kings of the north and the king of the south and if you read what Uriah Smith said about this now it's just between Seleucus who controls the west the north and the east and Ptolemy who controls the south and Seleucus is called the king of the north okay so let's continue on so Daniel chapter 11 is a literal chapter brothers and sisters it is not a figurative chapter it is a literal chapter now for some strange reason most ministers agree that Uriah Smith was correct verses 1 was correct in verses 1 through verse 35 and it's all literal and they go by the history but for some strange reason when you get to verses 36 through 45 they now spiritualize everything and say it's no longer literal that it's now figurative 
and it's spiritual. Brothers and sisters, there is no rule that we've been given that tell, tells us such a thing. According to William Miller, it is only figurative if there is, it, it's only considered figurative if there's a symbol or figure where it doesn't make, uh, it, it, con it goes, vi I'm sorry, it violates the laws of nature. It is to be understood literally unless it does violation to the laws of nature. But for some reason, now in the 1940s, a man named Louis Weir came on the scene with an Adventism. He was friends with Cottrell and he spiritualizes these verses and says Uriah Smith was wrong. But according to the prophet, Sister White says Uriah Smith was right. And we're going to see a title called Eastern Question and what she says about that in part three. Well, the end of this presentation and much in part three. And according to the prophet in 1904 and 1905, no after suppositions are to come when the truth has already been established. And in 1904, she said, all that we've taught in the last 50 years, anyone who comes in or teaches contrary are books of a new order. Okay? Lewis Weir's book, it is called, um, oh, what is it? Something about the third angel's message. I, I, I know the name of his book, and for some reason I'm forgetting. I'm drawing a blank. He was teaching books of a new order. And we don't have any biblical rule or principle to tell us. Verses 36 through 45 is spiritual. It's literal, brothers and sisters. And in Uriah Smith's book, in chapter 11, in the correct edition that I gave the links for, I gave you where you can buy the book, and I gave you the link where you could see the actual real book. Okay? It says on there, in chapter 11, a literal prophecy. And even on the CD-ROM, if you go to that CD-ROM in the Pioneer section, under Uriah Smith's name, and then click Daniel and the Revelation, and then click chapter titles, and then go to Daniel 11 chapter, you will see the title is a literal prophecy. Now, I don't recommend reading that book because many paragraphs have been removed regarding this very subject of the Eastern question we're going to be getting into in just a little bit. But, brothers and sisters, this is a literal prophecy. It is not spiritual. It is not figurative. It is not spiritual like many are claiming that it is and the reason they are believing this is because they are endorsing Lewis Weir but Lewis Weir's book is a book of a new order okay if you go to the chapter title in Uriah Smith's book on page 190 you'll see it's called a literal prophecy so now verses 36 through 45 our pioneers and I'm not going to get into detail of this right now. As a matter of fact, go read it because I will be going into verses 36 through 45 in part 3. We will be going into detail of that. So I don't even want to discuss it at this moment. So I won't be giving a short explanation here. But you can read about it. I believe it's in part 3. Okay, let's continue on. What well, we are counseled regarding Turkey. Now, I just skipped over Daniel 11:45, but let's look at verse 45. Okay? Remember, brothers and sisters, we're counseled to read what Uriah wrote leading up to the coming of Christ. There's two chapters where he deals heavily with this. Daniel 11, verse 45, and Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Read those in the correct book, in the correct edition. It's mind-blowing. Excuse me, some people don't like that terminology. It's an eye-opener as to what he reveals and what he wrote. 
And now I understand why these paragraphs have been removed from his book. I understand why the goat head has been removed from the chart because they did not want this information out to the people. But when you have a correct understanding of the goat head and the division, you realize it's four literal geographical locations. And then when you get to Daniel 11, it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south. It's literal kings in the literal north and the literal south. Not spiritual north and not spiritual south. Okay? So let's go to Daniel 11:45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Okay, let's see what Haskell has to say, who this is regarding this verse. And in part three, we're going to look at a lot of information from our writings, from the prophet, from the pioneers. And we're also going to look at current event articles to see that which Uriah Smith wrote is being fulfilled to the very letter today. But let's see what Haskell says. Remember, Haskell is the man who did the Bible training school in New York. He is a pioneer. Sister White said his writings were to be republished. Well, what we are about to read comes from a book called story of Daniel the prophet if you haven't read that book I highly recommend you do and in that book at the very front of that book when you open the cover it tells us that it come it was published in 1904 and it comes from uh, Stephen Haskell's Bible training school well we saw in part one sister white endorsed his Bible training school and what he taught at his Bible training school and a lot of what he taught, he put in this book. So we're going to see what Haskell says in this book. What's going on in Turkey is an indication of the movements going on with our great high priest and that probation on the world is about to be over. Before this can happen, Sunday has to be enforced, which is in the process of being done with the Pope's Le, uh, climate change encyclical titled Laudato Si. Now, these are my words. We are going to get to what Haskell said in just a moment. So, if you go to section numbers 68, 71, and 237 at the following link, you will see in 68, a Sabbath is being introduced. 71, it tells us why we must keep the Sabbath. And then 237 is the enforcement. And it's all referring to Sunday and that this is a part of the climate change. So, when we read what Haskell wrote, according to what is going on in Turkey, those movements that we're about to read right now is a sign that Christ is about to step out of the most holy place. Okay? But before Christ can step out of the most holy place, which represents probation on the entire world has closed, the enforcement of Sunday has to take place. So let's look at what your um, Stephen Haskell said, and then we'll go into a little bit more. And there is the link to the Pope's Laudato Si, which is the climate change encyclical. This is what was voted on at the Paris Agreement in December 2015, and this is why it's called the P Paris Agreement Act. And this is what they have agreed upon the world this is the one that Trump wanted to pull out of but he's now slowly going back into but the mayors and governors of the United States said whether Trump goes along with it or not they're not going to follow him a lot of Congress said the same thing and um, a lot of Trump's business partners have pulled out with him from him because he refused to go along with this and this Climate change encyclical is about the enforcement of Sunday. And I have a friend who the advisor, top advisor to the Pope on the climate change, told my friend in his face when he was in D.C. that the 
climate change encyclical is all about enforcing Sunday. So this is the enforcement of Sunday, this whole climate change encyclical. And it sounds really good, okay? It sounds great. You know, let's reduce emissions. Let's help with slavery and third world countries who are working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Let's give them a day off. That's great, but guess what? Sunday is not that day. Okay? So, before Christ can finish his work, Sunday has to be enforced. So, as we see the events of Turkey, which we're going to be learning all about in part three, everything Uriah Smith and Haskell and other pioneers said Turkey was going to do regarding the subject of the Eastern question is happening today. The following regarding Turkey is from Stephen Haskell's book, Story of Daniel the Prophet, and I went through that with you already. Though here's what Stephen Haskell said. Every eye is centered on that one spot and has been for years. Turkey is known universally as the sick man of the East, meaning the eastern part of Europe and sick because he was losing his power as of August 11, 1840. The time will come when he will remove from Constantinople and take up his abode in Palestine, that is, plant his tabernacle between the Mediterranean and Red Seas. This is page 247, paragraph 3 of Stephen Haskell's book and story of, the da of Daniel the Prophet. Now he is quoting Daniel 11.45, if you understand the language of Daniel 11.45. Let's continue on what he says. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried, saying, Hurt not the earth, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, brothers and sisters, he's connecting the angels holding the four winds to Turkey and what's going on in Turkey. And I have a, another presentation I'll be putting up in the near future called the four winds. You do not want to miss that presentation when it does come up. Now, why is this angel coming from the east? Because Turkey controls the east, Islam. And it, it did in their day, and now once again, the president of Turkey, Erdogan, is getting this power back, and he's uniting the Ottoman Empire. He's bring, uh, uniting Islam and reviving the old Ottoman Empire and wanting to take over. And so <coughs> the angels are over there holding the four winds, okay? And so now... The four winds are in connection with God's people being sealed. So there is a seal going on. We know this has to do with the Sabbath. So in order for us to be sealed, these four winds have to be held in check. Let's continue. These angels now hold the winds of strife, waiting for the church of God to prepare for his coming. The sealing angel goes through Jerusalem, the church, to place the seal of the living God on the foreheads of the faithful. And while this work goes forward, Turkey stands as a national guidepost to the world that men may know what is going on in the sanctuary above. Page 248, paragraph 1. So, according to Haskell, Turkey stands as a national guidepost to the world. And all you have to do is go in the pioneer section of the CD-ROM, type in Turkey, type in um, Eastern question, you're going to find a lot of information that's going to be very eye-opening. God's eye is upon his people, and he never leaves himself without a witness in the world. No man knows when Turkey will take its departure from Europe, but when that move is made, Earth's history will be short. Then it will be said, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Today is the day of preparation. While the world watches Turkey, let the servant of God watch the movements of his great high priest, whose ministry for sin is almost over. So, we're to watch our great high priest, 
whose ministry is almost over. So what's going on in Turkey? And we're going to see what this sign is. Okay? When Turkey leaves Jerusalem, excuse me, when Turkey leaves Constantinople and goes to Jerusalem, that is going to be the sign that Christ is about to end his work in the most holy place. And the United Nations just gave permission and said that the holy mountain in Jerusalem is no longer for the Jews, but it is Muslim territory. And in part three, we're going to be seeing what the Muslims all around the world are saying regarding Jerusalem. Okay, so although we don't have a date when Christ finished his work in the most holy place, we have an event. God gave us an exact date when Christ started his ministry, which was October 22nd, 1844. And he gives us not a date, because after 1844, there's no more prophetic time, but he gives us an event. And it has to do with Turkey. And brothers and sisters, this is some very powerful, fascinating, just fascinating information. Okay, Turkey and the Eastern Question. Elder Uriah Smith spoke on the Sabbath question to a large congregation this morning. And this evening he speaks on the Eastern Question. I feel so grateful that Brother Smith is not lost to the cause. He seems, he seems fully and thoroughly united with us. Seems like Brother Smith of old. Oh, thank the Lord. So Uriah Smith in 1884 is speaking on the Eastern question in the evening. Sister White already knows what this subject is, and she's saying, I'm so happy we have our Uriah. He's Uriah of old. I thank the Lord for him. Okay, this evening meeting was largely attended. Elder Smith spoke with great clearness, and many listened with open ears eyes, ears, and mouths. The outsiders seemed to be intensely interested in the Eastern question. He closed with a very solemn address to those who had not been preparing for these great events in the near future. So according to the prophet, that which Uriah Smith wrote regarding this subject is very powerful. And it has to do with the Eastern question. And she said we should be preparing for these events. She was endorsing what Uriah Smith taught on this subject. If you would like to hear um, a powerful series done on this particular subject, I did a several conference calls reading Uriah Smith's book and if you want to learn about this I believe it is reference numbers 30 through 33 and I will give you the phone number that phone number is 641-552-9271 that's 641-552 nine two seven one the access code is nine nine eight two nine eight pound nine nine eight two nine eight pound and then I believe its reference is thirty through thirty three and so it'll ask you for reference numbers start with reference thirty if not it'll be thirty one but you don't want to miss that very important information I will also be doing more videos on those calls as well but in the meantime you can go listen also go to the link that I provided in part one to read the correct book um, as a matter of fact I will I will post it here as well um, just one moment okay so let's continue on so here's the number to listen to the playbacks I'm actually giving you the number here it is area code 641-552-9271 
and the access code is 998298-POUND. And it's reference numbers 31 through 33, not 30 through 33 as I originally stated. And here's the link to the correct 1897 edition book. If you want to read about verse 45, when you go to this link, just type in page 333 at the top in the PDF where you can type in pages and it'll start you at verse 45 and you can read everything that Uriah Smith said regarding the Eastern question. Now what is the Eastern question? Everybody knows of the Eastern question though not everybody knows just what it is. Briefly and bluntly stated the whole Eastern question springs from Russia's design to possess Constantinople and the efforts of the other great powers of Europe to keep her from it. So Russia's goal has been to get Constantinople from Turkey and Turkey is the headquarters of Constantinople. Whoever dwells and occupies the territory of Constantinople pretty much controls the Bosphorus and those that waterway whoever controls that controls what ships can and cannot go into Europe and since the days of Peter the Great Ru um, Peter the Great told Russia to do whatever to get it from Turkey and so um, we'll be learning more about that in part three okay let's keep going for more than a thousand years Russia has been wanting Constantinople in this time she has made a number of attempts to gain it once she practically had it but a brilliant move of Britain with other powers prevented her from keeping it and thus arose the Eastern question in fact and Turkey Europe has been the ally of Turkey so that Turkey would keep Russia from getting into that waterway to get into Europe the Eastern question is not settled nor will it be until the Turks shall have been driven from Europe. So either Europe is going to kick Turkey out which in part three we're going to learn what they're saying about that right now or Turkey is going to leave on her own or Russia or somebody else might get her out. Um, however it happens when we see that taking place and Turkey going to Jerusalem something I forgot to mention United Nations in November declared that the Holy Mountain in Jerusalem is Islamic territory and does not belong to the Jews as I said earlier but what I didn't say is that in 70 AD we know that Rome destroyed Jerusalem and the Jews were wandering until the late 1800s or mid 1800s and mid 1900s and so in 600s like 695 AD the Muslims were abiding in that territory and in 695 they built the Dome of the Rock right over where Solomon's temple dwelt and we're told this by Stephen Haskell in 705 I believe it is they built their second mosque or their their third mosque it's the third most holiest mosque in the world and the Dome of the Rock is the second most holiest mosque in the world which is also in Jerusalem and the most holiest mosque is in Mecca and so in 705 Al Aska ASQA was built and now Turkey is saying they need to go there because they believe Jesus is going to return not as the Son of God they don't believe him a God but they believe him they don't believe him to be the Son of God but they believe him to be a prophet and he's going to bless their temples well with the United Nations declaring that this is Muslim territory now this is opening the way for Islam to truly enter into Jerusalem as the prophecies declared Turkey would do and one other thing I forgot to share 
Islam is mostly in the east, but it's Turkey who's in the north that was running Islam, the Ottoman Empire, was all of the fractions of Islam brought together. Now, what is the symbol of the Muslims? It's the crescent moon and the star. Well, what country has that on their flag? It's Turkey. That's Turkey's national symbol. Because according to Haskell, Turkey is the most staunch supporter, the strongest supporter of Islam more than any other nation. More than any other nation. Okay. So, um, here's a BBC article. BBC is from a um, British article coming out of Europe. It's titled, Turkey, the Eastern Question is Back. And this article came out in February of 2016. And if anyone would know what the Eastern Question, dealing with the Eastern part of Europe, has to do with, it would be Europe itself and they're connecting it to Turkey as does uh, Uriah Smith in the book in his book I posted the link in the previous section and um, if you click it click the link and go to page 333 type it in at the top when you get to the link and it'll take you to verse 45 of Daniel 11 and you can read what Uriah Smith says regarding Turkey and the Eastern question now if you try to find this on the EG White CD-ROM you will not be able to do so but from what I understand the EGW2 app that you can get on your phone has the correct edition okay so you can find it on there and here's the link to the article um, and then here's what it looks like that's a picture of what the front page of this article looks like we will be learning more about the Eastern question in part 3 okay so we have come to the end our next study which is part three of this uh, three-part PowerPoint series will be on Daniel 11 36 through 45 and the Eastern question in detail you do not want to miss part three and so uh, this is the end if you have any questions you can send an email to See biblical at yahoo.com. Until we meet again, may the good Lord bless and keep each and every one of you.